So the title of our message today is the Doctrinal Declaration of Discipleship Duty. Guess what? I discovered the thesaurus.com this week. <laughs> so that's the title you'll get. Actually, we're going to be doing a, kind of the philosophy of discipleship. Why? Well, almost three years ago, um, the church was looking for somebody to head up discipleship. And um, God had really put it on my heart uh, for discipleship for this church. And uh, so I went to uh, Pastor Ron and told him I was interested. And uh, he said, okay, this is what it kind of, uh, you know, discipleship is leaders all about. And I said, okay, that's great. Um, and, but the Lord was put, putting something together for me. And it, it took almost three years for it to be put together. And a couple of reasons for that was, for one, I have made the mistake before of coming into a church and uh, being, being the leader over something and, and really stomping on people's toes. And I didn't want to do that this time. Plus, I wanted you guys uh, to start to get to know me. Okay, start to uh, trust me, trust my, uh, trust, uh, my knowledge in the Word, and trust uh, my faithfulness in, in serving God. Okay, before I just started blasting you with, with uh, things. <laughs> okay, so that, that took a while. But also, I needed to train a group of people up to, uh, to kick off this discipleship program, if you will. And uh, that actually took uh, um, some time to do that also. But we're ready. So I asked, uh, I asked Matt if I could uh, have one week uh, to take the pulpit and introduce our, our new discipleship program um, and kind of share what God has laid on my heart and the vision for this church through discipleship. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll dive into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for faithful men and women in this church, Lord, that um, are faithful to your word, are faithful to uh, your cause, Lord, are faithful to your ways, Lord. And I thank you so much for that. Be with us today. Open our hearts and our ears, Lord. Let the Holy Ghost pay, you know, hang heavy on each and every one of us to help us understand what you have for us today. Help us understand what the, the vision is uh, for discipleship within this church, uh, for, uh, carrying here and on out into the future, Lord. Lord, it's, it's going to be a blessing. I know it, and I thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, right back to back, uh, Jesus, after he rose from the dead and was spending time with his disciples, uh, right back to back, he gives us a couple of commissions. Okay, the first one we see in Matthew 28, in verse 19, and we, we, we know this one, it's pretty well common as the Great Commission, but it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And then right after that, he comes back in Acts 1.8, and he says, be ye, uh, let's see, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. So the, this commission was twofold, okay? And we as Christians have failed in one of those folds. One fold is evangelism. We are to reach people for Christ. Yes, I think we do a, a pretty good job of that, okay? But the other one that we sometimes miss is the teaching, is the teaching. And that second verse in Acts 8, it says, witnesses. How do you teach? It's not just teaching the Word of God, but it's teaching with your life, being a witness to others. Okay, and we do that through discipleship. Okay, so we want, we want evangelism in the church, but we also want discipleship because we don't want to lead people to Christ to where they become newborn babes and then just throw them back out into the world and say good luck. 
We want to teach them. We want to raise them to young, uh, to, to young children, to spiritually uh, youth, and then eventually to a spiritual maturity where they then can lead others. Okay, so that, that is kind of the focus here in this. And we're going to be in um, Acts 18. So if you want to turn to Acts 18, eventually we will get there, I promise. But i got a few things to say that God has laid on my heart. Now, while Luke is writing Acts, he is basically focused on key people that are spreading the gospel, okay, the gospel of Christ. But here in Acts 18, he suddenly kind of uh, does something he doesn't usually do. He starts focusing on people that are behind the scenes, okay, not just the key people as in Peter and Paul as we know, but he starts focusing on uh, uh, a certain couple that are behind the scenes. And Luke shows us Paul multiplying his life and godly walk in others by discipling them. It's easy uh, um, to assume that everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say discipleship, okay, but Discipleship is what we're going to see modeled here in Acts 18. It's an informal, behind-the-scenes investment of the Word of God into the life of another person. It results in our walk with Christ being duplicated in another person's life. It is the sharing of life, not just the sharing of knowledge. So let me give you... Uh, my definition of discipleship. You guys know where the word discipleship came from, right? So let me tell you. Peter, James, and John, they were out fishing in their boat. And Peter looks around and says, you know what, guys? We are disciples of Jesus. So I think I'm going to rename my boat the discipleship. Okay. <laughs> All right. My definition of discipleship is discipleship is where one, per, uh, one person or couple ministers the word of God to another person or couple to help them grow spiritually and live out the Christian life. It's just not growing in knowledge. It's also maturing spiritually in the Christ walk that uh, we all have before us. It's like being molded. See, God takes the life and uses it to mold another life. He uses a biblical pattern, and he lays it out. And Paul does such a great job of showing this. Uh, we see here in Paul that uh, he discipled Timothy. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.1. It starts out and it says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see a deep relationship between the two, because Paul calls Timothy his son, his spiritual son. That would make Paul the spiritual dad, okay? Because uh, Paul took time to invest in Timothy's life and instill the Word of God and God's ways into Timothy. But then he goes on in the second verse, and the second verse is our key verse for uh, discipleship. It's 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. and I'm not going to have you recite it, Terry, Terry. <laughs> but it does say, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, in this one little verse, there are four generations. Um, so if you will, uh, we'll, we'll take Paul as the spiritual dad, who invests his time and teaches his spiritual son, Timothy and then asks him to take what he has learned and invest that time into faithful men, say, Paul's spiritual grandchildren. And then those men can take it and invest into other people, which would be Paul's spiritual great-grandchildren. So you see four generations right here in this one little verse. But for us to be able to have a uh, successful discipleship, Okay, we need, we need a little bit of a plan. And Paul gives us that plan laid out in Acts 18. So first, let's see, um, let's see what this plan is, because discipleship is, is not just giving of knowledge. 
It's giving of yourself in a relationship with somebody and helping them grow up. So it's not just this. It's also this. You invest your time with somebody. You invest your time with somebody. Turn my page here. We need faithful men and women to invest their time into sharing God's word, sharing God, uh, God's ways, Christ's ways, and their own life into somebody else's life so they can grow in the spirit, so they can do the same thing in someone else's life. So let's take that underlining thought here for a minute of faithful men. It's what we need. That's what every church should be filled with. Faithful men and women who are going to turn around and teach others to be Christ-like. We are trying to transfer to this generation and to the next generation the image of Christ on the rails of faithful men and women. This is the mission we have as Christians. To evangelize, yes, but also to disciple. Not only Paul gave us that model, but Jesus did when he discipled his small little group. And they expanded and discipled their small little group. So discipleship isn't just addition, it's multiplication. To raise people up to be faithful men and women for Christ. Fundamental Christianity too often has failed in this mission. But we must do it better. We must rethink our personal history and our efforts today to make the changes necessary to accomplish the mission Christ has given us. As Christian and ch Christians and children of God, we are um, supposed to be finding faithful men and women. We find those in our cities, our towns, our villages who will be faithful to Christ as, and, um, and his word. We are to be teaching them to teach others. As churches and God's children, we are to be working together to edify and perfect the saints. Lift them up. Bring them to maturity within the Holy Spirit. But as I was going through this, I found a, a couple of verses in the Bible that had some disturbing thoughts. The first one was in Psalms, Psalms 12.1. It says, the psalm, psalmist starts out and says, Help, Lord. Have you ever been there? Have you ever laid in your bed at night and you have no idea what to do and you just cry out, help, Lord? Well, the psalmist had, 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 had seen a disturbing thing around him. For godly men cease and the faithful fail among men, uh, I mean, among the children of men. That's why he was crying out for help. Because the faithful were failing. Now, if you want a verse that describes our times, if you want a theme verse that depicts our society, there it is. If you want a statement of Christianity in our culture today, there it is. Faithful men have failed. We do not want to be that church. And our ultimate mission all church growth is tied to finding and reproducing faithful men and women in our urban, academic, and vocational environment. Now, if that's the problem, what's the solution? How do we know a faithful man or woman when we see them? Well, Jesus, he chose Peter. Now, if you've ever studied out Peter, I mean the Peter before Pentecost, you may wonder why God would choose Peter. <laughs> so the better question might be is um, how do we know a faithful man or woman before they get to be faithful? How do we know which ones will finish the race? If they're not self-starters, how can we tell who to invest our time in? Would you have chosen Peter before Pentecost? Well, that answers our question. We're not choosing. God is choosing. We need to let the Holy Spirit bring in the ones that need and want to learn the Word of God, that need and want to mature to a place of faith, being faithful. Let 
The other verse that disturbed me was in Proverbs 26. Um, it says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. We need to find those faithful men and women right here in this church. We need everybody to be taught, raised, and mature to be faithful men and women in this church. If we do that, we will be a church so strong it cannot be split. A church so strong we will reach not only Lathrop, but the surrounding counties around it. And through missionaries like the Snodgrasses, we could reach the world. But in order to do so, we have to have a successful discipleship program. So let's look at a few points of what uh, will make a successful discipleship. Point one, leadership rises and falls on discipleship. Leadership rises and falls on discipleship. The goal of discipleship is to bring men and women to a place where they can lead others. Lead them to Christ and lead them to faithfulness. All biblical leadership is dependent upon discipleship. The quality of discipleship in our churches depends on the quality of training we have submitted to. That's why God can take a Peter and make him a leader. Point two, discipleship moves on the rails of relationships. See, it's not just an academic thing. Yes, discipleship does teach the Word of God, and it does make sure that all members of the church are on the same page concerning our basic doctrines. This is important because we don't want members to, uh, to be teaching false doctrine. Okay? But if we would teach this in a classroom setting, all that uh, would result is knowledge. And like uh, Proverbs says, knowledge puffs one up. Okay? So we don't want to just do it uh, to, uh, just to teach knowledge. But we need to come together um, as, as a woman with a woman, a man with a man, a couple with a couple, one-on-one -on -one discipleship to instill a relationship with each other. The Word of God runs through society on the rails, the railroad tracks of relationships. That is why we are commanded in the New Testament to love our neighbor as ourselves. The message of God hinges on our love for one another and for our neighbor. You see, Jesus took all the Old Testament laws and he broke it down into just three commandments. Love God, love your neighbor, and love the brethren. We can only do that through relationships. Jesus reached out to people where they were. He went into their homes, into their places of work. He walked where they walked. He entered into their ships. And we must do the same. We must enter into their lives. And we must reach out and minister to their needs. We must build relationships and only then can the witness, uh, we witness to them and teach them how to minister to others. The success of discipleship depends upon relationships. The success of leadership depends on discipleship. So now let's look at the third point, and uh, we'll put a balance to this vision. The third point is relationships start or end on lordship. If Christ is not Lord of our lives first, how can we show Christ to others? Start with lordship, move forward on relationships, and lead in discipleship. That's our fundamental mission and should be our basic focus. Whether it is in youth group or teen kids, whether it is in cell groups or music ministry, whether it is in missions or elementary ministry, all those things are nothing but tools to get faithful men and women involved in the mission of lordship relationship, and leadership through discipleship. Relationship is the heart of discipleship. We can do nothing for God if we are not willing to build a relationship with somebody. 
We cannot obey God if we are not willing to reach out and love our neighbor. This is prominent. You know, and it might be even more important than knowledge, at least initially. Now let's see what it is that is our responsibility as an individual Christian in our congregation. Where do we fit in? Paul says to Timothy, you invest your life in the lives of others just as I have invested my life in yours. Take the same things I taught you and teach them to other faithful ones just like yourself. Raise up leaders so that the masses can also be taught. So let's finally go to the book of Acts, Acts 18. And let's see Paul's model in Corinth. Paul's model in Corinth. Acts 18 verse 1 says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. This is the major thing. But what's the counterpoint? What's the subplot to this drama? When Paul came to Corinth, what did he do? He did three things, and at each place, there is a particular action and reaction. So let's see, action one. He associated close with a certain couple. In verse two, we see, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, late, lately came from uh, Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by uh, their occupation, they were tent makers. Paul, um, Paul initiated a relationship. Remember how we said discipleship moves on the rails of relationships. And he, when he did that, he found something he was looking for. No, not a job. He found an opportunity for ministry. Action two, he trained them in the word of God. Verse four says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and the Greeks. And if you drop down to verse 11, says, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. He invested his time. A year and a half he invested in them. There was formal teachings, but there was also informal fellowship around the word of God. In other words, there was a natural give and take of life among friends. And to Aquila and Priscilla, Paul's walk became... Um, very uh, authentic, not perfect, but real and honest. Action three, he multiplied himself through his disciples. He used his disciples to multiply this discipleship program. Look at uh, verse 18. It says, And Paul, after this, tarried there at a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence to Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shown um, his head in uh, Centuria, for he had a vow. Okay. The key, there, the key here is that we see Priscilla and Aquila, they, Priscilla and Aquila, have been disciples, and now they join Paul in ministry. And that's our ultimate goal for discipleship is to get people to uh, become faithful enough to God and his word to get into ministry for him. So they join him in ministry and then verse 19 it goes on and says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself uh, entered into the synagogue and, uh, let's see, reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. He now leaves his disciples in, um, in Ephesus to carry on the mission. He had discipled them for over a year and a half as a missionary couple. Now there is not just one ministry, there is two times as much ministry. There is multiplication in ministry through discipleship. 
not just addition. Then, this is where Luke leaves Paul for just a little bit and goes behind the scenes because he wants to follow up and see how Paul's disciples um, um, live their lives and, and how they carry on with what Paul told them. In verse 24, in Acts 18, it says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Here are Aquila and Priscilla, uh, discerning, keen-thinking Christians who thought, hey, there's something this guy's left out. His message was not inaccurate, but it was incomplete. So, so, uh, so immediately, Paul's disciples are saying to themselves, we need to take this guy into us, just like Paul came to us and taught us. In verse 26, it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, who when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They cared enough to take him and invest their time and invest in his life by discipleship. They noticed uh, what he said. They invested their time in discipleship, but they didn't expound the word of God to him. Um, that's probably what a lot of us would think they might do. That's probably what a lot of us would do. Um, you're wrong there. Let me show you and prove to you in the Bible where you are wrong. Sometimes that needs to be done. But what they did was expounded the way of God more perfectly or accurately. So how do, you, how do you expound the way of God? It's not just from the Word of God, but it's also by example. We not only teach the Word of God, but we show them the ways of God, living a Christ-like life and sharing our lives with them. When God gave Apollos the spark of a new vision, they supported him in that. Now, they're in Ephesus. Ephesus is in Asia. He wanted to pass through Achaia, and Achaia is in Europe. Corinth is in, Europe, uh, in Achaia. I'm starting to sound like our vice president. <laughs> um, look at what Paul sees um, happen now to the life of his spiritual grandson disciple. Okay, Here in Acts uh, 18, verse 27. After being discipled, it, you know, the, 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 the passage kind of reads like this happened instantly, but it didn't. There was some time that passed. Remember, uh, Paul, during this one chapter, had spent over a year and a half with Aquila and Priscilla. So time had, 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 uh, had passed here. Um, when we get to verse 27, it says, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Paul must have been a proud papa, and a proud granddad here. In 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions his grandson in this letter. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Apollos watered. Talk about multiplication of ministry. Paul's disciples, Aquila and Priscilla, who discipled Apollos, who goes to Corinth and has a ministry discipling the same people that Paul led to Christ originally. No wonder they turned the world upside down. 
we see from Acts 18 that when Apollos got to Corinth, he did two things. He discipled those that believed and convinced those that did not believe that Jesus was Christ. He was doing the mission, the co-mission. He was evangelizing and teaching. Remember, this discipleship program is just basic doctrines. It's getting us back to the fundamentals of the Bible. But by the end of being discipled, I can guarantee you, and this may be a sad statement, but it should encourage you also, I can guarantee you by the end of discipleship, you will know more Bible than most Christians out there. But more important, you will have grown extremely and tremendously in the Holy Spirit. Now, I've spent the last 20 weeks raising up a group of people to help me start this uh, discipleship program. And I'm going to ask a few of them, whoever wants to come up, and kind of give a testimony, encourage you guys to see what this discipleship program can do in your life. Do I have any volunteers that want to come up and, and share what happened? Come on. Uh, me and Joy both went through the class, and um, if you're in your Bible daily, which I pray you are, but I'll be the first to admit, life gets busy and I'm not in my Bible daily. I always have my prayer time, but after doing this study, you find out there's a lot of things that you've heard over the years that you thought were biblical truths, but they're things your grandma said, or your parents said, that you seem to think were, well, that's got to be biblical. If you're in the Bible, if you're studying the Bible, then you can share the Bible with truth to those that you're sharing it with. Otherwise, you're just giving them hearsay sometimes. It sounds biblical, and you might be on the fringe of right, but it is an absolute truth. And being able to walk alongside of people, like you say, and make a relationship, I hardly knew the hackers at all until we'd done a play which was uncomfortable for me, even though I'm on stage a lot of times playing music. We done a play and I got to know the hackers and, and, and the and Morgans and we just had a ball. And there's that relationship. Building those relationships is what grows fellowship within a church. And that's not easy to do. Everybody's life is busy. And just Sunday mornings is great to come around, shake hand, tell everybody hi, love them, care for them, get a hug. But if you're not having that relationship ongoing during the week with some of the ladies group, when they go up on Saturday mornings and they get together and uh, jokingly called the hen house, but they all get together and they're sharing God up there. And they're sharing truths. And sometimes it's like, well, she's gone all the time with women, but I know what she's doing. She's up there, I, no, this is true. This is true, I'm confessing. <laughs> but the thing is, that's how you build relationships. That's how you get stronger in brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how you build one another up and edify each other. Daniel and me spent the day the other day digging dirt in my, and doing a, some grade work around my new shop. And he comes over, oh, I'm so excited. And of course, you've never seen Daniel excited. <laughs> I'm sure that he talks in his sleep. <laughs> but his excitement because of something he was happy for me and just being able to share that. Dennis, and when he first came to the church, I hit it off with Dennis. I don't know, something similar about us, but there's things that we just, he needed something. I said, sure. And, and that's what we want to do with each other. And then when you got that started, the relationships get stronger and stronger and stronger and you can share with each other and then you share with people that don't know Christ. If you want to talk to somebody about something, get to be their friend first. Because if you're their friend, they'll listen to what you have to say. If you're just spouting Bible, they'll listen for a little bit, but they'll walk away. Because they want people want to be accepted and people want to be cared about and people want to be loved. 
this discipleship training taught me to build truth when I'm sharing the Bible, to know absolute truth about it, but to love and to share who I am with other people. And they're going to share back with me, and you're going to find out, hey, you know, we're not that much different than one another. It's not about, oh, I'm way smarter than you. I know more Bible than you. No. I've lived life a lot longer than most of you. And there's a lot of things I've been through that you're going to go through. And because of who Christ was in my life, I got through them. So those are the things you can share. All right. Thank you. Marsha? Well, I was a little intimidated in his class. I not a great <laughs> education. I stumble on the big words in the Bible and stuff. But um, he gave his scripture to read. And once you started, God just melted your heart. I mean, you were looking for your time to get alone with the Lord and to read about him. And it was so awesome because you start realizing they were going over basic things that we all knew about who God was and what love is and what it really meant. But... I mean, it made me aware to be open and looking for where God wanted me and what he wanted me to do. And you didn't really know, but you opened your heart every morning with, God, use me today. Hmm. And I, I work in a barber shop, so you get a lot of grubby guys. And, but people, whatever I studied about, if I just listened, somebody was asking me, where's God in life? And I could share. I mean, sometimes I stood back and I didn't, you know, and I felt bad at the end of the day because I knew God was tugging on my heart, you know, and somebody, somebody had somebody die in the family, you know. They were alcoholics and stuff, and, but he was searching, you know, what happened to that family member. And I knew, you know, the Bible tells us, and I was able to talk to them and to share what God says, not what I said or what the world's saying out there. But God was wanting those people to hear the good word, the good word, you know, of what Christianity is and what love is and where he wants all of us to be. And it is a friend, you know, you're just a friend. And they listen. That's a, these are people that would maybe never be in a church, you know, but um, they wanted to hear about God. And they seem to notice I'm different at the barbershop. You know, we tell jokes, and some are clean and some are not. You know, the people do. But um, they know something different about me. And when they're struggling or, or down and out, they'll, they want to they wanna ask questions. You know, people are out there. God's tugging at their hearts, whether they realize it or not. And if you could just step up, and it gives us encouragement and hope, and we can pray scripture with them. You know, not in the shop, I step outside or something, but it helped me just be bold for God, you know, to share his word, what he's laid upon our hearts, everybody's uh, doors are open, you just got to step through them. It was awesome. I loved it. Marsha. Marsha was great because it seemed like almost every week she'd come back and said, what we just taught on last week, I had an hour. It came up this week. It's just, and that's how God works in our lives. Anybody else want to give testimony? Okay, here we go again, talking in front of everybody. Um, <laughs> he's really using using that this week for whatever reason. I too was intimidated, Marcia, because I didn't feel like I knew the Bible enough to be able to share with anybody. And I was always afraid to share my testimony because, oh, you know, my testimony is not that big of a deal. Nobody will be able to relate to that. Well, Kathy and I had an opportunity to go to India, and every time we were in a situation, they're like, do you want to share? I'm like, mm -mm, no, go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'll just watch and I'll just listen. Well, going through this, it helped me realize it's not about me and it's not about my story. It's about what God has done through me and in me that I can share with other people. Um, and you'll be amazed at if you are just willing. Um, it is kind of scary sharing your story because you don't want to be judged. It's not up to everybody to judge your story. It's for you to help them get through their story and encourage them to use their, share, their story to share with others that might be in that situation. So it was really good, but I was very intimidated too, but it was very good and I, I really enjoyed it. So I really encourage every, anybody and everybody to take it. So. Thank you. 
All right. So we're kind of running out of time. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of stop the testimonies there. But, to, you know, ask around. You know, uh, um, there, there are other people that were in that class that are really excited about it. So let me kind of give you my vision real quick here. Um, we are going to um, disciple people that first come to Christ because they need the training. They need to grow. We are also going to disciple people that are new members of the church. Um, so they can be on the same page with our basic doctrines that we believe are truths from the Word of God. Um, but my prayer and, and my vision is that everybody in this church go through discipleship. It, it, it doesn't matter if you've been here a week or, or 30 years. Um, it will be a blessing for you to go to discipleship. And if God lays it on your heart that you would like to disciple somebody else, you'll have to first go through discipleship yourself. That way you can learn how we are, are, are kind of doing it, how it's laid out, and how to present that to somebody else. So uh, I, I pray that God puts it on the hearts of every one of you to share your life and, and make that relationship with somebody so they too can grow in the spirit, mature to a faithful man or a woman, and lead somebody else in the same ways. So we're kicking it off today. If you want to be discipled, if you know somebody that uh, would like to be discipled, come to me. We'll pair a lady up with a lady, a man with a man. They'll sit down with them, not here at the church, at a restaurant, in their homes, in comfortable situations, and they will start leading them and sharing their life with them. And we'll also do couples with couples. So if you would like to be discipled, or if you know somebody that uh, could be discipled, uh, come to me and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it and we'll team, uh, team uh, you guys up with somebody. So this is the kickoff of that. So I think it's going to be a massive blessing in this church. And uh, I think it's going to be a blessing in, in everybody's lives. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your position, uh, provisions, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the model that Jesus himself and Paul and Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos, a model of discipleship that they all laid out for us that we can look at in the Bible and we can take that example and lead others into the ways of Christ. Help them grow, Lord, and help them mature. We want to grow this church. No, I'm not talking about the building. The building is fantastic out there, but it's just a building. We want to grow the church in your ways and in your doctrines, Lord. So please, Lord, help us to do that. And, and I believe in all my heart, if, if we put this and make this a focus, that this church will grow mightily for the kingdom of God. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.